I'm really excited to have to sit in the middle of a, a great panel of speakers. Um, I'm Ibrahim Anli, the executive director of Rumi Forum, based in Washington, D.C., and, uh, and the sister organization of the Niagara Foundation, for, for those in Chicago who are familiar with Niagara's work. And, uh, and I will um, introduce each one of our speakers and uh, who will have uh, a nearly a 15 minute window and after we are uh, we list we have listened all all four of them we will turn to the audience for their um, questions and uh, as highlighted in in the very title we are looking in that one specific layer of gifts in in the legacy of uh, four faith pioneers. These men of faith come unquestionably with a variety of uh, gifts in terms of their leadership, legacy, and spirituality. But one particular aspect that we want to highlight and revisit today is their stance to stand with the displaced, the outlandish, the marginalized at moments that was the most difficult. Their ability, not as uh, superhuman beings, but as humans. That was a very important reminder that Reverend Shank made, made yesterday. As human beings, that they were able to uh, go against the stream at moments, challenge the status quo, and be a support for, um, for the marginalized. So now um, I'll turn to our, uh, I'll introduce our first speaker and get his remarks. Um, Father Don Rooney has served as president of the National Catholic Association of Diocesan Ecumenical and Interreligious Office Officers, known as CADEO, um, for 12 years and pastor of St. Bernadette Church in Springfield, Virginia, which we had the privilege to visit in, in a night of profound fellowship and uh, learning. A parish family of about 11,000. He was ordained in 1994. For over 20 years, he has served as the director of the Office for the Ecumenical and Interreligious Affairs for the Diocese of Arlington, Virginia, as well as a number of related organizations and has been an active participant in national and international dialogues. He's a board member of the Interfaith Council for Metropolitan Washington, D.C., and a great friend and ally of Rumi Forum. So, Father Rooney, please tell us that particular aspect of Pope Francis. Good morning. I'm particularly humbled to have this um, this presentation on who has become one of my heroes. We consider a remarkable human being today whose life reflects a radical respect for all of God's creation. Where many talk, he truly walks the walk. His rule of relationship of human fraternity challenges us not to recognize one another as human beings, however, but as sisters and brothers walking together. Pope Francis is a passionate voice that wants to confront the many, many of the difficulties of this post-postmodern age. He challenges those whose, many whose perceptions of themselves and the other have been conditioned by tribalism for so long that his encyclical Laudato Si on environmental justice, nonviolence, care for creation, equal rights, solidarity, and a just economic order against today's backdrop of author authoritarianism is heard as a manifesto of liberalism by many. It is not. These values have been the bedrock of order for religions for centuries. Also, there is the reality that many Catholics actually don't know the teachings of their own church proclaimed over the last 60 years. So a lot of what Francis says today sounds like something new or something he made up, and it is not. As a parish priest, I often meet with couples who are preparing for marriage we do a survey as part of our preparation, a survey of many statements 
to which the groom or bride-to-be will either agree or disagree. One of the statements is, having a set of religious values to live by is important to me. Over the past 30 years, it has been surprising how this response has shifted. Today, more disagree than agree. But then I asked them if the statement rather said, having a set of moral values to live by is important to me. Would you agree? Of course, they always answer. It is the word religious that spooks people now. Belief is understood as a force that divides, and our failure to recognize one another as family is to blame. We are to blame. So in 2014, Pope Francis' message on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the foundation of the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue speaks about the moment of awakening before Vatican II when St. Pope John XXIII exclaimed, throw open the windows of the church and let the fresh air of the spirit blow through. He meant for the spirit to blow, to move in as well as out. And by the way, the fresh air is outside. <laughs> Pope Francis speaks, at that stage, characterized by great openness, the church visibly manifest in the conciliar hall, felt inspired by a sincere desire for encounter and dialogue with humanity as a whole, in order to be able to present herself to a rapidly changing world in her deepest and most authentic identity, the church must enter into dialogue with the world in which she lives. In a general audience on October 28, 2015, Pope Francis speaks, the Second Vatican Council was an extraordinary time of reflection, dialogue, and prayer, which aimed to renew the gaze of the Catholic Church on herself and on the world it was a reading of the signs of the times in view of an update oriented by a twofold faithfulness, faithfulness to the tradition and faithfulness to the history of all men and women of our time. In fact, God who revealed himself in creation and in history, who spoke through the prophets and comprehensively through his son, speaks to the heart and to the spirit of every human being who seeks the truth and how to practice it. He lists the themes of Nostra Aetate in this, in this talk the growing interdependence of people, the human search for the meaning of life, of suffering, of death, questions which always accompany our journey, the common origin and the common destiny of humanity, the uniqueness of hum humanity, religions as a search for God or of the absolute within our various ethnicities and cultures, the benevolent and attentive gaze of the church on religions. She rejects nothing that is beautiful and true in them, the church regards with esteem the believers of all religions, appreciating their spiritual and moral commitment. One is the community of all peoples, one their origin, for God made the whole human race to live on the face of the earth. The church therefore exhorts her sons and daughters that through dialogue and collaboration with followers of all religions, carried out with prudence and love and in witness to the Christian faith and life, they recognize, preserve, and promote the good things, spiritual and moral, as well as the socio-cultural values found among them. Nostra Aetate, by the way, passed at the Second Vatican Council by a vote of the assembled bishops 2,221 to 88, and was promulgated on October 28, 1965, by, by St. Pope Paul VI. In this audience, France, Francis speaks, the dialogue that we need cannot but be open and respectful, and thus prove fruitful. Mutual respect is the condition, and at the same time, the aim of interreligious dialogue, respecting others' right to life, to physical integrity, to fundamental freedoms, namely freedom of conscience, of thought, of expression, and of religion. The world looking to us believers exhorts us to cooperate amongst ourselves and with the men and women of goodwill who profess no religion, asking us, for effective responses regarding numerous issues, peace, hunger, the poverty that afflicts millions of people, the environmental crisis, violence, especially that committed in the name of religion, corruption, moral decay, the crisis of the family, of the economy, of finance, and especially of hope. We believers have no recipe for these problems, but we have one great resource, prayer. We believers pray, and we must pray. Prayer is our treasure from which we draw, according to our respective traditions, the re to request the gifts that humanity longs for. Francis in 2015 continues, because of violence and terrorism, 
an attitude of suspicion or even condemnation of religions has spread. In reality, although no religion is immune to the risk of deviations of a fundamentalist or extremist nature in individuals or groups, it is necessary to look for the positive values that religions live and propound and that are sources of hope. It is a matter of raising our gaze in order to go further. Dialogue based on confident respect <coughs> can bring seeds of good that in their turn may bud into friendship and cooperation in many fields, especially in service to the poor, to the least, to the elderly, through welcoming migrants and attention to those who are excluded. We can walk together taking care of one another and of creation, all believers of every religion. Together we can praise the one for giving us as the garden of the world to till and keep as a common good, and we can achieve shared plans to overcome poverty and to ensure for every man and woman the conditions for a dignified life. My point thus far has been to illustrate that Pope Francis, though often characterized by his discreditors as one who breaks from tradition, actually is the faithful voice of a tradition which threatens to recall them to the truth of who we are, not who we would like to be or who we pretend to be. Father Peter Fan, a Jesuit theologian, he was actually my professor for Theology 101 at the University of Dallas 40 years ago. <laughs> he explains Francis' understanding of interreligious dialogue, for as Francis prefers to call it interreligious encounter in this way. Francis approaches interreligious dialogue prim primarily as a pastor and a practical theologian, not as a systematic theologian like Benedict XVI, who was concerned mainly with expounding on the doctrinal and theological issues implicated in the dialogue. Francis, when still Archbishop Bergoglio of Buenos Aires in his dialogue with Rabbi Skorka, described what dialogue should be. Dialogue is born simply of a respectful attitude toward another person from a conviction that the other person has something good to say. It supposes that we can make room in our heart for their point of view, their opinion, and their proposals. Dialogue entails a warm reception and not a preemptive condemnation. To dialogue, one must know how to lower the defenses, to open the doors of one's home, and to offer warmth. In his encyclical Fratelli Tutti, Francis comes closest to formulating a theology of interreligious dialogue. Consistent with his theme of fraternity and social friendship, Francis says he intends to follow the example of St. Francis of Assisi, whose name he took as Pope. Francis of Assisi did not wage a war of words aimed at imposing doctrines. He simply spread the love of God. Like St. Francis of Assisi, who traveled to visit the Sultan of Egypt, Malek al Kamil, nephew of Saladin, Pope Francis traveled to see the Grand Imam Ahmad al Tayeb and signed the Abu Dhabi document on human fraternity for world peace. The goal is peace. The way to achieve a pragmatic good is through dialogue. So I speak of Francis' approach as the approach of a pastor. One of the greatest experiences I've known as a priest in this work happened in June of that same year, 2015, when I was one of 46 who gathered for a dialogue of Buddhists and Catholics from the United States in Rome. You see, I am not a trained theologian in interreligious affairs, but Francis wanted to add pastors to the theologians in the dialogue. And at the time, I was a pastor of a parish of 15,000 people in Fredericksburg, Virginia. We exchanged papers on suffering, liberation, and fraternity. My paper was on the value of suffering from a Christian perspective and the self-emptying love of God. But during the course of the week, we met with Pope Francis and had the opportunity to greet him. Cardinal Jean-Louis Tarron, then the president of the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Di Inter Dialogue, said in his introduction, in a world where diversity is seen as a threat, the encounter is a sign of our openness towards one another and our commitment to human fraternity. We are all pilgrims, he stressed, adding that the dialogue between Buddhists and Catholics is part of our ongoing quest to grasp the mystery of our lives and the ultimate truth. At our audience, Pope Francis addressed us himself. And I quote, in this historical moment so scarred by wars and hatred, these small gestures are seeds of peace and brotherhood. You are planting them. The Holy Father thanked us for our visit, which he said was a sign of brotherhood, dialogue, as well as friendship. These are things that do great good, that are healthy, he said. 
Concluding his address, Pope Francis called on us to sow seeds of peace and brotherhood in our meetings, and before making his way to St. Peter's Square for his Wednesday audience, he blessed us and sent us off to figure out how, in our communities in the United States, Buddhists and Catholics were going to create places of encounter, affordable housing, and medical care. That was June 25, 2015, four months before the general audience that I've been quoting today, the conclusion of which I would like to end with now. Pope Francis speaks, Dear brothers and sisters, as for the future of interreligious dialogue, the first thing we have to do is pray and pray for one another. We are brothers and sisters. Without the Lord, nothing is possible. With him, everything becomes so. May our prayer, each one according to his or her own tradition, adhere fully to the will of God, who wants all men and women to recognize they are brothers and sisters and live as such, forming the great human family in the harmony of diversity. Thank you, Father Don, for um, helping us explore that particular um, impact of Pope Francis. Um, um, in, in Washington, D.C., we have our annual Interfaith Leadership Forum, and one year was dedicated to a whole day of uh, study of uh, Fratelli Tutti, and uh, that document being anchored in tradition, um, yet so able and by no means hesitant to, to be able to speak to an aggressively secularizing world was amazing, you know, this uh, combination. So that's, I, as you were uh, recalling and referencing to that document, that was uh, what I was um, recalling. Um, now um, I turn to our second speaker, the Reverend Dr. Rob Shank, who is an ordained evangelical Christian minister and public theologian. For more than three decades, Dr. Shank was a Washington, D.C.-based activist on the religious right. He interacted with numerous members of the U.S. Congress, two presidents, and for 20 years, several justices of the United States Supreme Court. In 2015, Dr. Shank was the subject of the Emmy Award-winning documentary, The Armor of Light, examining the American evangelical embrace of, the, of popular gun culture. Following that experience, he broke with his religious community's positions on the Second Amendment, abortion, and same-sex marriage. Today, Dr. Shank identifies as a progressive evangelical and a loving, constructive critic of American evangelism. He is the founding president of the Dietrich Bonhoeffer Institute, named for the renowned World War II era German church leader, moral philosopher, and Nazi resistor, whose ideas on ethics have inspired generations of noted religious figures. Dr. Shank is currently merging his Bonhoeffer work with programming at the Miller Center for Interreligious Learning and Leadership at Hebrew College, Newton, Massachusetts, where he will soon take up his new post as visiting scholar of Christianity and religious leadership. Reverend Shank, um, take us please into the story of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Thank you. Uh, each and every one for the introduction, especially the Parliament, for this opportunity. I'm always thrilled to talk about the extraordinary man I like to call my posthumous mentor and best des dead friend, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, especially in this context of embracing the other in unwelcoming times. Today, though, I must include a caveat. Until recently, Bonhoeffer was, for me, the one who could do no wrong. He was literally the perfect exemplar of ethical religious leadership. But after studying his life closely over the last dozen years and talking to much better informed colleagues about 
the real Bonhoeffer compared to the mythical one, I'm a bit sobered and a little bit more realistic in my assessment of the man. He was, after all, a creature of his time and cultural context. Having said that, and notwithstanding his shortcomings, some of which I share with him, and maybe you do too, I hope to persuade you that his life, his ideas, and his model of courage can be of enormous help to us, particularly when it comes to embracing the other. Now, I imagine many of you know quite a bit about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, but in case you don't, allow me this precy of his life and legacy. Born in 1906, Dietrich was the sixth of eight children, his mother, a certified school teacher, his father, a noted psychiatrist and professor. Theirs was an upper class privileged household maintained mainly in a Tony neighborhood of 1920s Berlin. Though not a terribly religious family, Dietrich at age 14 precociously announced he intended to study theology, much to the pleasure of his mother Paula but to the chagrin of his agnostic father, Karl. Once in university, though, Dietrich pursued his discipline passionately, leading to the venerable Karl Barth declaring Bonhoeffer's first dissertation, Sanctorum Communio, a theological miracle. From there, the young scholar began a meteoric trajectory in the academy. At the same time, he followed a more usual course in the church as a cleric until 1933. That's when he took great offense at Hitler's Aryan paragraph, banning anyone with Jewish blood from holding federal government jobs, including as pastors in the established Evangelische Kirche. From then on, Bonhoeffer would become more and more an ardent Nazi resistor. He was eventually imprisoned, tortured, and in April 1945, executed at the Flossenburg concentration camp. Bonhoeffer left behind a trove of writings on theology, ethics, and human relations which were meticulously curated by his confidant, Eberhard Betka, and are now published in the multi-volume German and English editions of the Dietrich Bonhoeffer works. As I alluded to, Dietrich is a bit of a mixed bag when it comes to our noble theme. His privileged, semi-aristocratic, highly educated, and ethnocentric formation <laughs> left him a certain deficit in this area. His world was white, European, and of uniform socioeconomic status. He also exhibited a hint of German nationalist impulses, and maybe a residual <coughs> unconscious anti-Semitism. Big question mark. Still, even as a teenager, Dietrich had been curious about other religions and cultures. At 18, he traveled to Rome, Sicily, and North Africa, gushing in letters home about the interesting people and customs he encountered. Later, he engaged in vigorous ecumenical exercises that would last throughout his career. Of course, the latter was exclusively Christian, but an early 20th century German Lutheran reaching beyond his provincial boundaries was somewhat radical. Moreover, Dietrich's interest in the Catholic Church was tantamount to following after the Antichrist. <laughs> so by nature, he was rather daring and subversive regarding religious norms. Then came 1933, and with it, Nazi party control, 
extreme legislative measures, restricting speech, among other things, and granting dictatorial powers to Adolf Hitler, and that law banning pastors with Jewish blood. Bonhoeffer strenuously objected to that measure, but narrowly. He saw it as the offense being the expulsion of converted Jews, clergy with Jewish backgrounds whose baptism had made them members of the Christian populace. So there's that problem. And it's a big one, especially in Jewish-Christian relations. And of course, it has wider implications. In preparation for today, I spoke with Bonhoeffer scholar and translator Vicki Barnett, who's done extensive work on this period as a German church historian and expert on the church's role in the Holocaust. She's doing new work on this element in Bonhoeffer, vis-a-vis -vis his disposition toward the treatment of Jews in Nazi Germany. She thinks he approached this problem as a limited civil rights issue, not a distinctly universal religious or theological one. Regardless, Bonhoeffer embarked on a progressively more and more empathetic path on the Jewish question as he frames it in his famous essay by that title. He will eventually help with a project to safely convey several Jews out of the country. And it is in part what he learns from a brother-in-law, Hans von Dananyi, about the scale of persecution, murder, and seeds of Jewish genocide that propels him into the risky venture of a conspiracy to assassinate Hitler, which of course seals his fate. Notwithstanding this complexity, I want to point out a few things about Bonhoeffer that can help inform and inspire interreligious embrace today. First, it goes without saying that the backdrop to Bonhoeffer's life and work was one of the most unwelcoming, hostile, and anti-human periods in global history. Add to that the contemporaneous European conventions of patriarchy, misogyny, elitism, and extreme nationalism, and you have a really toxic environment even outside the Third Reich. Meanwhile, in the United States, immigration officials refused entry to Jewish refugees. And of course, American blacks, including veterans who fought against the Nazis, were denied their civil rights, human dignity, and even lives when they were lynched or otherwise brutally murdered. It's in this setting Bonhoeffer accepts a postdoctoral fellowship at Union Theological Seminary in New York. While there, he visits Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem at the invitation of a close colleague, Frank Fisher, one of only two African-American fellows at Union. Abyssinian is a center of black life and activism in 1930s America. Not only does this blonde-haired, blue-eyed Teuton embrace the community at Abyssinian, but after a subsequent road trip that takes him through the ferociously segregated South, he declares that the only place in America one can hear the true Christian message preached with integrity is in the, quote, Negro churches, end quote. And his observation of how black church leaders suffer with their people eventually thrusts him back to Germany to suffer with his compatriots, including Jews, Roma, homosexuals, and political dissidents. Here is a good place to note a crucial concept in Bonhoeffer's thinking. Stephretretung, or vicarious representative action. In his posthumous magnum opus Ethics, he writes, the commandments of God's righteousness 
are fulfilled in vicarious representative action, which means in concrete, responsible action of love for all human beings. Bonhoeffer scholar and my good colleague and friend Stephen Haynes, professor of religious studies at Rhodes College, explains, Stefeltretung, most simply, is Bonhoeffer's description of how human beings are to be in the world. As Christ lived and died vicariously, his disciples are called to vicarious action and responsible love on behalf of the other. This element of Bonhoeffer's ethics translates perfectly into the interfaith encounter. Ver uh, vicarious action is expressed in, say, concrete Christian advocacy and protection for Muslims who wish to build a mosque, or of Sikhs who have been attacked at their temple, or Jews who have been menaced by neo-Nazis carrying tiki lamps. Responsible love is demonstrated in the affirmation of every religious <laughs> adherence human rights, a humble appreciation for what the other may know that the Christian doesn't know or can't know, or a celebration of what the Christian and the other share in common. All of this, I would argue, extends from Bonhoeffer's Stefan Tretung. Maybe Bonhoeffer did all that he did for the other within the constrictions of his privilege. Or perhaps he did it after abandoning those strictures. Maybe he did it as much out of self-interest as he did it for the benefit of others. But as I see it, he did it. <laughs> he reached beyond himself, and that is always an epic human odyssey, especially to embrace the other. So he remains a unique inspiration for reaching out to embrace the other in unwelcoming <clears throat> times, even in supremely unwelcoming times, and in quite costly ways. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reverend Shank, for uh, helping us revisit Bonhoeffer's story in a demystifying way that d does by no means any damage to, to his legacy, but even elevates it um, further. And as you were uh, helping us navigate his, his story, I recalled the contemporary mid-century uh, uh, Quranic commentator Nursi's remarks about World War II victims. He was approached by his predominantly Muslim audience, and they asked, you know, what, what are they? What, how should we define them, those who died during the war? And he called them martyrs by victimization. So uh, probably um, Bonhoeffer is one, one chief martyr of, of that era. Um, now I will um, turn to our third speaker, Dr. Ori Soltes to tell us about uh, Fethullah Gülen, a Muslim luminary and scholar of similar caliber. Um, Dr. Soltes teaches at Georgetown University across a range of disciplines from art history and theology to philosophy and political history. He is the former director of the B'nai B'rith Klutznik National Jewish Museum and has authored or edited 28 books and several hundred articles and essays. Among these are Searching for Oneness, Mysticism in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, Our Sacred Signs, How Jewish, Christian, and Muslim Art Draw from the Same Source, Embracing the World, Fethullah Gülen's Thought 
and its relationship to Jalal ad din Rumi and others, and his latest publication, Between Thought and Action, an Intellectual Biography of Fethullah Gülen. So, Dr. Soltis. Thank you, Ibrahim. <coughs> Thank you, Ibrahim. It is certainly a pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, wow, what a distinguished panel and distinguished audience. Um, Fethullah Gülen was born into a Turkey that following the lead of Ataturk, who brought the modern state into existence in the course of the 1920s, in the aftermath of the end of the Ottoman Empire uh, and its crashing conclusion through and in the immediate aftermath of World War I. It was a Turkey that, following uh, Ataturk's lead, was rigorously secular. When I say rigorous, rigor rigorously secular, I mean not that it simply thought, well, church and state should be separate, but expressions of religious conviction in any public form were considered essentially illegal. So much so that it took two years for his birth to be registered because his parents, who were pious Muslims, bo on both sides of the family, long lineages, had the temerity to name him Fetullah, which for those of you who are listening carefully, even if you don't know Arabic, will recognize has the word Allah in his name. And therefore, this is an illegal name because it defied the secular norms. So it took two years for him actually to be registered uh, as birth because his father was um, prominent enough in his small community that there was a, a, a government clerk who finally said, shh, 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 we'll just register his name. But it was two years after he was born. But Yulen himself was drawn to spirituality at a very early age. He was already interested in the Qur'an uh, by the age of four, by the age of five. It's not clear because you hear different versions, whether it was by the age of nine or 10 or 11 that he was called a Hafiz. A Hafiz is someone who has memorized the entirety of the Qur'an from beginning to end. That was the kind of intensity of his interest um, he had problems with his first grade teacher because he was so pious and you were not supposed to express piety at all. He had another teacher, however, who was very fond of him and recognized his brilliance because brilliant he was. It is interesting that as a young man, uh, he was not only drawn to Islam in all of its ins and outs and its range of literature, and not just the Quran and not just the Hadith, the lives of the various and sundry key figures in the course of Islamic history, which, by the way, that history goes all the way back to Abraham, and not just from Muhammad forward, you understand. So he, he accumulated an enormous amount of knowledge about this. Um, his formal education didn't carry him past middle school. But beyond that, he also would eventually encompass everything you can imagine from Socrates and Plato to Einstein in the kind of range of issues and ideas that drew him intellectually. He trained as an imam following the strictures that oddly enough, uh, or perhaps not oddly enough, the secular state required, so he was formally ordained, so to say, as such, by the state and he became an imam. But he realized early in his presence as such two things. No one's coming to the mosque for prayer except old people. And the young people seem lost. And he concluded they're lost because their sense of identity in particular, because Turkey since the end of the 13th century was a largely Muslim country. By the 20th century, 99% of it is Islam, is Muslim. And yet a rigorously secular state is one in which youth have no understanding of attachment to familiarity with that part of their identity. And so he felt that they were, they were kind of lost. And um, so he left, he didn't leave the mosque. He continued to do his job as an imam. He continued to offer a sermon every Friday at the noon prayer, but he went out into the coffee shops and he hung out there and he'd get into conversations with kids. And the fact that he was developing this enormous range of knowledge meant that they could ask him about anything, and he had answers. And so he attracted a growing following of people who started to take what he was saying, 
the Turkish word for what he was doing is called a sohbet, a kind of discussion of things. And so these tapes of Gulen's sohbets made their way from hand to hand, from ear to ear, and from mouth to mouth, from mind to mind, across much of Turkey. So he developed quite a following. But by the 80s and 90s, he had come to recognize something very important. And that is that it's not about Turkey. It's not about Islam. It's about humans. It's about all faiths, <laughs> all ethnicities, all nationalities. If we're not in it, all of us together, then in the end, none of us ends up benefiting from what with whatever it is that we, th we think we want to do to improve things. So he became increasingly expansive with respect to an interfaith, interethnic, international, multicultural kind of pattern of thought. Um, he was inspired, among others, by Rumi, the 13th century <coughs> Sufi, um, whose poetry includes all sorts of references to his recognition that as much as he, Rumi, as a Muslim mystic, is, could not be more intensely Muslim, who seeks to be one with God, who seeks to reach a point where he can't even distinguish himself from God, that there's no contradiction between that and being a universalist. I go into a church, I go into a mosque, I go into a synagogue, I see one altar, is a very famous phrase ascribed to Rumi. Because what Rumi came to realize was, and what Fatullah Gulen came to understand was, that if one claims to love God, then one must love what, that which God hath wrought. And if all traditions agree that God created all of us, and everything beyond just the human race, all of it, then I cannot not love it all and claim truly to love God. So if I'm ultra-particularistic, ultra I'm contradicting my claim to be a lover of God. But it was not just a matter of his thinking or his speechifying or his preaching, but the actions that he began to take to deal with, and if any of you were here in the previous session, you heard Ali uh, uh, Yurtseva reference Said Nursi, and Ibrahim just mentioned Nursi a moment ago, who had identified three particular issues that were problematic for humanity, one being poverty, one being ignorance, one being inter-everything kind of strife. And these are issues we need to solve. So what Gulen began to develop was a movement that eventually would be called the Hizmet movement. Hizmet is the Turkish word for service. So it ain't about, as Father Rooney said, just about the talk, it's very much about the walk. Mm. Schools, from elementary schools to university level schools across Turkey, across the Turkic language nations of Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, eventually across the world, 170 countries. <coughs> and those schools have an extraordinary range of curricula that go from math and science to literature and humanities and languages to art to sports, because it's everything that needs to be encompassed and not just part, part of things. Education dealing with poverty by way of social service programs, by way of charitable programs, and dealing with strife by way of an increasing array of interfaith programs that involve every day, uh, everybody, multicultural programs, international programs that involve everybody. This was not, and it is not the norm in Turkey. So if I think of Fethullah Gulen, not just in terms of what he is, was and is about, but specifically about pushing against the mainstream, to be developing this kind of a sensibility within the Turkey of the 80s and 90s and moving into the early 20th century, proved to be problematic. He was at odds with the government again and again and again because they suspected him somehow of trying to undermine what they were about. So there was a kind of interesting coalition of anti gulen forces within the Turkey of the 80s, 90s. On the one hand, the secularists, who feared that he was trying to turn Turkey into an Iran, which was not his goal at all. And on the other hand, the Islamists, who resented the fact that he was having the temerity to have conversations with Jews, Christians, 
with Muslim denominations which were not their denominations. So a kind of coalition of secularists and Islamists seeing in him a kind of boogeyman who from their respective perspectives, their limited perspectives, was a threat to Turkey uh, overall. The irony is multiple. His interest is in civil and social Islam. His interest has never been in political Islam at all. Um, and yet, at the beginning of the millennium, he and Mr. Erdogan, who currently runs Turkey with an iron <coughs> fist, as you probably are aware, appear to be on the same track, which was the bring of Turkey into a modern world which would be simultaneously up to date in its relationship to itself and the world, which would be restored with respect to its Muslim soul, but open and fully open, not just tolerant, but embracing of non-Muslims within and beyond Turkey. And it was Gulen's conviction that Islam's most compatible political sibling is democracy. And he perceived in Erdogan someone with the same sort of ideas, which until 2002 seemed to be the case. If you follow the uh, trajectory of Erdo Erdogan's career from 2002 to 2011, you realize that he is over a nine year period moving slowly from an embrace of to a rejection of democracy. At a certain point around 2009 or 10, he says, you know, democracy is like a train. You have to know when to get off. And by 2011, that trajectory became extreme. And between 2011 and 2016, he gradually absorbed every angle of power and control within Turkey from the matter of the media to the matter of the judiciary to the matter of the legislature to the matter of the executive so that we, s we see him now at this point as one of the handful of most um, stunningly complete dictators across the planet. And part of his instrumentation for affecting that rise was to turn 180 degrees against Gulen and everyone associated with him so that his met became for Erdogan a kind of boogeyman against whom he could direct all of his efforts. One of the interesting moments in Gulen's career, who had left Turkey in 1999, come to eastern Pennsylvania for medical reasons, he has a, a heart condition, and his physicians kept saying, you can't go back to Turkey, it's too, it's too juiced up there, it's just not good for you, you've gotta stay here. Um, is that when the flotilla, the Gaza flotilla catastrophe of Israel-Palestine, of Israel-Gaza, took place in uh, May 31st, uh, 2010, a flotilla of six boats that were bringing, or were alleged to be bringing, resources to Gaza that were not allowed to get through a blockade imposed by the Israelis on Gaza. And mind you, I'm not talking about the current situation, I'm talking about 2010. The knee-jerk reaction when the Israelis prevented the blockade, prevented the flotilla from getting there, which resulted in injuries and deaths, the knee-jerk reaction of most of the media, and certainly in the Arabo-Islamic world, was to criticize Israel. Gulen, rather extraordinarily, wrote vigorously in the opposite direction. He said the Israelis were doing what they were both legally and morally supposed to be doing, and this was a deliberate attempt to provoke them. It turns out, in fact, that not only was he going against the grain, very much so, courageously, but that he was right, because it turns out that Mr. Erdogan was behind it because he was hoping to disrupt relations between Turkey and Israel to his own political ends. It's a moment. A year later, Erdogan has started to remove the power from uh, the other constituent elements within Turkey. By 2013, there's a corruption scandal. By 2016, July, he has created a fake coup reminiscent of the burning of the Reichstag in 1933 by the Nazis, pinned on the communists and pinned on the Jews that enabled Hitler to move forward, pinning it on his met, a failed coup which was not failed but faked. Erdogan from that point forward, of course, had a fairly clear path to completing his power. And um, uh, as for Mr. Gulen, 
he had not only has continued to preach, to teach, to write, but his followers, who needless to say, were very, very, very depressed in the aftermath of that event because it looked like things would collapse. I am pleased to say it backfired. Mr. Erdogan's attempt to destroy Hizmet by that event because Hizmet has grown and continued to be strong and continue to do what it's supposed to do, Hizmet, which is serving humanity across all kinds of denominational borders in all kinds of different ways, inspired by Fethullah Gülen. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Soltis. And as we listen to our speakers, this shared characteristic of um, in combined intellectual gift and personal courage keeps manifesting itself in different stories, contexts, and under different names. And, uh, and as you were talking about the, the, the foundations of, of the movement Mr. Gülen envisioned, um, just in a very um, explanatory way, he was once asked whether uh, whether people, Muslims in, in the West, live in the abode of Islam or abode of war, which is a medieval construct that Muslim scholars had developed. And he said, no, the entire globe is the abode of service. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we just, we, as we listen to the stories of all these luminaries, they're those liberating interventions into the way faith is interpreted has been very transformative. So now I turn to our last speaker, Rabbi Morris Zimbalist, uh, who is the senior rabbi of Congregation Beth Judea in Long Grove, Illinois. Through his leadership and vision, Rabbi Zimbalist has partnered with lay leaders to advance Congregation Beth Judea's commitment to embrace every synagogue member's religious and spiritual journeys with warmth, compassion, and kindness. Rabbi Zimbalist has advanced Congregation Beth Judea's involvement in Israel, education, and advocacy. Interfaith dialogues with the local Christian and Muslim communities, inclusion in initiatives for all people seeking to engage with the congregation irrespective of cognitive, emotional, and physical challenges, and strategic planning to ensure a vibrant future for the congregation and for the members of their Jewish community in Chicago's northwest suburbs. So today, Rabbi Zimbalist will be speaking about Rabbi Zalman Shachtar Shalomi, known as Reb Zalman, and his legacy. Rabbi. Thank you, Abraham. Again, like, uh, like the other speakers, everyone can hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, well, Boker Tov, Shalom Aleikum, and good morning to all. Uh, one of the things that I want to point out is almost the end of what I want to say based on listening to the rest of our panelists talking about uh, the various luminaries that they were representing when it comes to interfaith relations and the importance of dialogue. And that is each of the various figures who have been mentioned thus far, and I will bring in a fourth, started in one place with one perspective and then took a journey to better themselves and inspire others so that what we inherit is better than what they inherited. Mm -hmm. And I hope that um, everyone here today takes on that challenge, irrespective of any panelist who you may have been inspired by or any luminary you may be, have been inspired by, but that is life for us is a journey together so that we can make sure that the world is a better, safer, more tolerant, loving, peaceful place for our children, grandchildren, and countless generations still to come. Uh, it is an honor to be here today and certainly sit uh, alongside Professor Soltis, uh, Reverend Shank, Reverend Rooney. Thank you for all the organizers of the parliament. What an important event this is for all of us to come together. And whereas we find within uh, different religions we might see each other as 
different and different instills fear. I have to tell you the warmth and interest of this room is fabulous. And certainly for those who have pulpits or have preached to groups before, one of the best things that can happen is when we run out of seats. That's the best, you know. So this is a wonderful thing for all of us. I, I certainly also just want to extend my, my gratitude uh, to Ferhat Kazkandu of the Niagara Foundation, uh, who I feel is his family to me. Uh, to Norm Kurtz from our congregation, Beth Judea, uh, for encouraging uh, me to be here today and to speak on behalf of Reb Zalman. Um, and to all efforts of everyone in this room. And I teased a little bit the front row as we started, uh, who are from my congregation in Long Grove, Illinois, um, that oftentimes we as clergy members or religious figures, uh, when services start, we have a, a large sanctuary and everyone sits in the back. Thank you for sitting in front. <laughs> Thank you, that was very, very nice. Um, so when we're talking about these luminaries, who they were, how they inspired, where we are today, and how we move forward, I feel strongly that there are pivotal moments of, trans of transformation irrespective of our religious identities. And certainly we've heard this from the other three panelists. Um, shared experiences of a lifetime that we have. It can run, run the gamut of uh, different personal experiences. However, just for example, uh, many of us have shared the experience and joy of a birth of a child. Many of us have celebrated holidays and milestones, birthdays, anniversaries together, their weddings, and certainly we mourn together knowing that our time together is very limited. And even if we live, in Judaism there's the tradition of you should live as old as Moses was at 120. If all of us are blessed with that longevity, which to the best of my knowledge other than Moses, um, we, we, we tend not to be, um, our time together is precious and short, even if we make it to 120 years. Much of what brings us together to this day and what starts dialogue, as, as others have said up here, are shared experiences. And we are beyond, in my opinion, the idea of simply reading a textbook to learn about an experience. We have to have the face-to-face -face contact. We have to have the holding hands together at times of loss and times of joy. We have to be by each other's side and doing our best to experience emotions that we might not ordinarily experience. And to give those examples of shared experiences, my very first year with Congregation Beth Judea, I was standing uh, at my lectern and it was October 27th, 2018, when one of the members of the congregation came to me and said, there was just a synagogue shooting at Tree of Life in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And as we know, over the past uh, week or two, the verdict for um, the person whose desire was to kill Jews was determined by the court. Um, who comes in? to our memorial prayer, hope, and healing type of service, Fairhot and the Niagara Foundation, dear friend, who I, who I didn't know yet, dear friends from the local Christian community, Reverend James Preston, others like him come in. We have representatives of the Interfaith Council of the Northwest Suburbs coming in. Why? They wanted to support us because we needed them. And today, just as everyone sitting here needs each other, everyone sitting here needs each other, and we need to be together and united in that idea that we can and we should make things uh, ebb and flow, as I like to say, between different shades of gray, knowing that very little is 100% black 
or 100% white within any of our religious traditions. We, we experienced as well the Christchurch Mosque Massacre in New Zealand, 51 dead. Not anti-Semitism, Islamophobia. This is a permeating our societies today and many of those from Congregation Beth Judea who were here gathered together with Muslim friends and Christian friends to help and mourn again another unthinkable loss. Um, earlier this year, when we all saw on the news and heard of the devastation in Turkey and Syria due to the massive earthquake, Farhat calls me, Farhat reaches out, our congregation, our Christian friends, our Jewish friends go to Niagara Foundation. And when we talk about stepping out of a certain comfort zone and putting ourselves in the shoes of the other, we experience some of the most powerful emotions that I have ever experienced and certainly offered our help and support as best as we can and thank God we were able to provide some help and some support. So even doing a little bit can make a huge difference. Uh, we've heard from our fellow panelists about the importance of the similarities of teachings from scripture and inviting faith leaders from different religions to talk and to lead um, various services that could perhaps be thought to be another clergy's role. So for example, how can we learn from each other? Well, just as I've been afforded the opportunity to speak at Niagara Foundation, okay, um, Farhat, I, I'm looking at Dr. Alexander, others who are here have had open opportunities to come and be part of our Jewish congregation, our extended family for joys, sorrows. We've been together for iftar dinner, dinners, communions, coming of age ceremonies, like uh, a bar or a bat mitzvah when a Jewish child turns 13 is considered to be of age. Um, in fact, Dr. Alexander and Farhat and others from this room uh, attended my daughter's bat mitzvah this past April. Um, so how do we define our interfaith relationships? What makes a person a pioneer to ensure that this light shines bright between the major world religions and all world religions? How do we look at each person as a human rather than a Jew or a Christian or a Muslim or a, someone whose color of skin is dividing them, uh, 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 defining them, or in a case where we have different um, gender identities or sexual orientations. What do we do to share our passion and love in order to be a pioneer among interfaith relations? Well, we, um, we just heard about uh, Fatullah Gulen, and I'd like to quote him, it was very beautiful. This is a quote from Fatullah Gulen. Our civilization will not progress until we treat suffering of humans, regardless of their religions or ethnic identities, as equally tragic in our own empathy and respond to all suffering with the same determination. That's important. That's what we need to do. The gentleman who I am honoring this evening, this is, excuse me, this morning, um, Rabbi Zalman Shachter Shalomi, who as uh, we heard is referred to as Rabbi Zalman says this, as believers, we all have an opportunity and moral obligation to recognize our spiritual common ground, to rise above our differences, to combat prejudice, and intolerance. It's an honor to be here this morning to speak with you about Reb Zalman, an interfaith pioneer who modeled the importance of recognizing pivotal moments and modeling how experience shapes our spiritual identity. Reb Zalman was born in 1924, and he added the name of Shalomi to his given name because in Hebrew, Shalom means peace. And when it says shalomi, the e is a suffix. 
and it stands for, in a sense, my peace, my journey, my hope for peace for others. Interestingly enough, that same word shalom can mean full or complete. And we're saying here, perhaps Reb Zalman is also saying, for us to truly help to make the world whole and complete, we need to embrace this idea of shalom, of peace with our neighbors, because when we look at our scriptures, irrespective of the prophets, you know, we, are, we are one. We are one person, and our prophets preach love, and it's important for us to understand that, that are we our brother's keeper? Well, yes, we are, because if we're not, who's going to watch out for us? And we need to do that together. Um, Reb Zalman was a preacher and a teacher and an author, and much like I mentioned at the beginning of, the, um, uh, of, of my conversation with you, he was raised very orthodox. So we would define that as more of the very stricter side of religion where things tend to be more black and white. And he went through his journey of gray to be among the founders of the Jewish renewal movement and an innovator of, ecumen of ecumenical dialogue. He created some innovations to help interfaith relations. We need to have paradigm shifts within Judaism, but we need to have paradigm shifts within religion. And I feel that right now we are at a critical point in our time emerging from a difficult time of the pandemic that affords us the opportunity or perhaps is the catalyst for us to do new things, keeping our traditions alive, presenting them, learning them, living them and experiencing them differently. We have to create meaningful connections among the religions. And we have to remember, this is Reb Zalman who's saying this, and um, I would venture to guess that many would agree that religion is much more than ritual. In Judaism, Congregation Beth Judea represents much more than three prayer times a day. It's these experiences that we create so that we can be inclusive and diverse and be willing to try to connect through experiences other than what one would assume is tradition. For example, music, poetry, meditation, actions that benefit the greater community. We were talking, Farahat and I, just prior to this um, presentation, that we need to take our kids, the Jewish kids, the Muslim kids, the Christian kids, on shared experiences that mm. they can experience together. Mm. That is what's going to make, in my opinion, a strong effort for positive and proactive change. Reb Zalman liked to talk in psychological terms, and he would use the word cross-situational consistency, one of my personal favorite psychological <laughs> terms, and that is you are who you are, whether you're on the pulpit or you're sitting in a room or you're at a coffee house or at your own home. You are who you are, and we have to be consistent throughout our situations. Our faiths demand that of us. We have to be true to ourselves, religion, and God. We have to support each other in the good times and the less than good times. We have shared values of peace, love, kindness. The list can go on. Um, two other quick quotes here. One, again, from Reb Zalman. In the context of interfaith encounters, we need to bring to the surface how our actual beliefs share what we do, not simply agree that kindness is better than cruelty, there must be much more. And Fatullah Gulen said, love is one of the most subtle blessings that the all-merciful one has bestowed upon humanity. Recognizing this takes us to even a deeper understanding of interfaith relations. Um, Reb Zalman emphasizes three things. One, we have to use our heads. We have to learn from those who think differently than us and in Judaism, there's a teaching, Ezehu Chacham, who is wise, halo made me kol adam, one who is willing to learn from everybody. We have to use our hands and work together to develop new innovative ways to make the world more peaceful, loving, and tolerant because it doesn't feel like the world is moving in that direction right now. Lastly, we have to have open hearts. 
And we have to be willing to share emotions, get out of our comfort zones, and allow ourselves to experience um, it, different celebrations and sorrows from other perspectives, different traditions and rituals from other perspectives. Um, I'll conclude with, um, with a quote from Reb Zalman. Reb Zalman says, rivers, ponds, lakes, and streams. They have different names, but all contain water. Reb Zalman continues, religions have different names, but all contain the truth. Thank you again for this wonderful opportunity, and may God's blessing shine brightly upon us all. Thank you, Rabbi Zimbalist, and uh, about the first point that you made, that striving so that those who come after inherit better. Um, I was, uh, it reminded me of, uh, of um, a comment from, uh, from a renowned Muslim scholar he, who remarked, uh, may God be pleased with, with our predecessor. They left so many questions to the successors to answer. So we are truly gr grateful to, to all those luminaries for leading the way and, um, and uh, <coughs> challenging us to, to continue further. So um, now we have another 10 minutes <laughs> for the uh, audience to, to address their questions. Please. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I feel very much at home by the ideas that were represented here. Um, I come from a Jewish background, my parents. I lived in Iran some of my years, where I was around the Russians, Muslims, um, Jews, everybody. Um, what I had discovered, this is the first time I am at the parliament. What I discovered in talking with a lot of people um, about what what is it that is dividing us then, as we are claiming that all we are worshiping is the same God, however I think everybody's God in their heads is different than the others. Um, but what is it dividing us? And um, the answer was almost unanimous. The way we feel about it. The way we feel about it. It is our feelings that separate us because of our experience. And I'm sitting here, all men, all <laughs> <laughs> women. Why not? We did not consider women worthy of being able to be present. Well, we because we, ex yeah. we feel it. And I think the feeling does not match. Yeah. I, I welcome that note. Uh, thank you. That's statistically true. You know, that cannot be challenged. But we tried to reach out to uh, female speakers, but couldn't. They were not available. But thanks for. Uh, that note and uh, yeah, people comments. yeah can you can each yes. take one minute to to answer this very question <laughs> feeling is like belief belief is like feeling it transcends reason and I certainly agree with you about how important it is in fact it's at the heart of what religion is all about um, the problem with human history and human geography is that belief uh, has again and again and again been connected to self ego, what I believe, and too often too many of us have decided that what I believe is what is objectively true and what you believe is not because it's not what I believe. So it's about learning that it's about something which is beyond reasoning it out, talking it. It is about feeling, it is about belief, but as such, your beliefs and your feelings are as valid as mine, and there's no contradiction between the fact that you feel differently and you believe differently from how I do because there is what it is that is beyond us is beyond us. And we can never know in the two plus two equals four sense about that. It's what we do believe. And so there's no contradiction between my feeling that my form of faith is 150% the most perfect form of faith for me and that yours is 150% perfect for you. But the trajectory of our understanding that is still taking little steps. May I challenge yeah. that? Uh, no, so, so excuse me. How about afterwards? Yeah. 
Uh, so may I turn to our uh, other speakers who want to yeah, take another minute for by each to comment on that? Thank you for making that point. Uh, in some of the work now on Bonhoeffer, one of the things that we're trying to point out is that there were many more people doing much more than Bonhoeffer did uh, in Germany, and most of them were women. And that's very important because they were frankly ignored in post-World War II Europe uh, and the United States because they didn't fit the hero profile. And that's really, really important. So Elizabeth of Berlin is a film you should see by, uh, by uh, Steve Martin, not the comedian, <laughs> the historian. Um, the, the only, the second thing I'll say is that when I speak for my evangelical tribe, fear is the number one motivator. It's fear of the other, which is really fear of losing myself. And that's something we're trying uh, to approach. So thank you for that very insightful yeah. question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, not yet, no. uh, ju just to be very brief and, and thank you to the other two responses, um, I agree fear is one reason, uh, but I want to thank you on a very personal level because one thing with inclusion and dialogue and things like that, sometimes the obvious is overlooked. And even if the obvious is occurring at any given time, we can't rule out the attempts that were made to make this inclu as inclusive as possible. So I appreciate those attempts, but I appreciate you raising this mm -hmm. issue because by doing so, you've helped us to become even more of thinking from another's perspective and uh, being inclusive in dialogue. So thank you. I like to use the metaphor of real estate. I think that um, if we all think about moments in our lives where we had kind of an, uh, an awakening moment, where we might have realized that there are seeds of racism or prejudice or things in our own lives, we catch ourselves in that thought. Uh, one moment for me was when uh, Pope Francis, and so, so the context, of course, is Holy Thursday when Jesus gathers with his apostles and institutes the Eucharist for Christians, and, and um, he takes off his robe and he gets down on the floor and he washes the feet of his apostles and he says, as I have done this, you must also do. Um, when Pope Francis suddenly was washing the feet of a young Muslim woman, I had like a snap in my head. I'm like, this is, wait a minute, this is, this is not my real estate anymore, right? Mm -hmm. This is something that, that somebody has done to point out why we're here. And so I'm here to talk about Pope Francis. He always talks about all those who are rejected and left behind on the peripheries of our society and in our world, the ones who are the forgotten poor who are being, whose lives are being destroyed by climate change and things like that. And so we find ourselves um, with that, and that's why I say it's, just, it's like real estate. Do, do we own this or can we kind of live in the same space? Thank you. We uh, just, just another two minutes, so I, I, with apologies, heartfelt apologies, I have to conclude that to respect the time for the uh, next panel. Um, so when, when you approach a Sufi, Sufis are, you know, you can describe them in many ways, but you can call them troublemakers. <laughs> so when you approach a Sufi and say, we're all the same, the Sufi will respond, but we are all different. And when you say, we're all different, the Sufi will challenge you and say, but we're all the same. So can't think of a better testimony than today's panel that reminding us this, this very fact. And, um, and I'm just moved, trying to uh, get to my, my reminder and, and call for action, if you will, that there is an ongoing great deal of uh, injustice about the concept of interfaith, that uh, an understanding, maybe misunderstanding that this is about uh, an, uh, overemphasizing similarities and maybe disregarding or playing down differences. I, uh, I invite everyone to be ambassadors, that this is not the case. We invite everyone to be solidly anchored to their faith traditions, yet come to the room to explore and build 
positive mutual regard. As Dr. Soltes says, there is Rumi, the universalist, and there is Rumi for the, you know, for the lack of a better term, maybe there is Rumi the Orthodox. And he was both at the same time. That's why he was uh, Rumi. So we have a branding problem, I have to admit, and I invite everyone to be our allies to, to correct that. So thank you very much.